This is the first lecture. I'm basically going to go through Scripture. Scripture is the foundation for what we believe. Everything should be built on top of Scripture. So I'm going to cover Scripture first in these first two presentations. So if you're expecting to hear about geology or DNA or any of those good things, I'm getting there. I just haven't quite gotten But we've got to cover Scripture first. And this first one, we're going to mainly center on two worldviews. I'm going to discuss how we got to where we are today. Because most churches today, whether you know it or not, 95% of churches today do not believe in the literal historicity of Genesis. They don't believe, necess- they think Adam may have been mythological. They don't believe it literally. And, uh, and I absolutely do. I'm going to be up front with that. And some of you may not know me very well. I've been going here, as Merle said, about a year and a half. This is my wife and I. This is what we looked like six years ago before we had children. And so still don't have any gray hairs yet, but I'm looking forward to that. This is my giant dog. This was when he was about 175. He's now 185. But he's an English Mastiff. Really good dog, though. We've also got a Basset Hound. And uh, this is my little girl. She had her coffee that morning. So, I'm an engineer. I've got an undergraduate degree and a master's in mechanical engineering, and I work for Lockheed Martin designing jet fighters, which sounds much cooler than really what I do day to day. But I do use science in my daily job. I work specifically in the propulsion department, doing performance with the jet engines. So it's kind of cool. Basically, a seminar overview. We're gonna, these first two lectures, I, when I originally did this series, I did it with a friend of mine. And we, we spent, we thought it was going to take about two months to do the, the research and stuff. And about six months into it, we were about halfway through the first presentation. And we had spent hundreds of dollars on books and, th- and hundreds of hours reading through them and trying to put it together. And we found so much information out there. We, we could not believe how much information was there. And uh, so we really had, we came up with, after about a year of research, we came up with about 1,200 slides And it really only scratches the surface of the information that's out there. And so we thought, well, can we really cover all this information? And we thought, well, there's so much here that people don't know about, we need to. And so we call it the Creation Science Crash Course. Put your thinking caps on, because we're going to go through a lot of stuff during these presentations. So make sure you get a cup of coffee and you're you're prepared to be thinking. Uh, The first presentation uh, is going to to cover two worldviews. The next one, we're going to cover Genesis and the Flood. Where did the water come from? Where did it go? Uh, what happened after the flood? What were the pre-flood and post-flood environments like? Really interesting stuff. The next one, we're going to cover geology, then biology, then ancient man and dragons, also known as dinosaurs. Did they really live with man? Mm, good question. And then astronomy will be the last one. And some of the best evidences are in astronomy. And there, there are some absolutely irrefutable uh, evidences there. So it's really fascinating stuff. So let's go ahead and get started. All of the evidences outside of the Bible, they do not prove the Bible, but they do confirm that the Bible's history is true. We're going to talk about biases, axioms, presuppositions, your starting point for how you build your worldview. In a minute, we're going to show that. Uh, Jesus said in John 3.12, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe them. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? A lot of people, they, they don't believe the history in Genesis, and therefore they think that the Bible is antiquated. And therefore, they reject the entire Bible. Um, And I'm going to talk about that more later. I don't like to catch people off guard. I'll tell you exactly what I believe about things. Because I know I don't like to be caught off guard when I'm talking to people. I like to know where people are coming from. I never like the professors who stood up there and were like not telling you what they actually thought about things. And they started philosophizing and stuff. So I'm not going to do that to you. I believe that the Bible was created in six literal 24-hour days. On day one, earth, space, time, and light. Day two, atmosphere. Day three, dry land and plants. Day four, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, sea and flying creatures. Day six, land animals and man. I believe that. And I think that the, the scientific evidence confirms that to be true. Not only is, is this put forth in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it's put forth in three other places. Exodus 20.11, Exodus 31.17, and Hebrews 4.4. 4 which seem to confirm that the, the days that are described in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are six literal 24-hour periods. Uh, Exodus 20.11 says, For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Sounds like six 24-hour day, days to me. Exodus 31.17, It is a sign forever between me and the Israelites, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested. If they took these to be literal, literal days, we should as well. And then Hebrews 4.4, 4, the seventh day he rested. 
I believe that I believe in a very young Earth. I believe that the Earth was created about 6,000 years ago, and I'm going to go through some of the genealogy today that I believe shows that to be the case. We don't know exactly. We're not going to pin it down to 6,004 B.C. on December 12th. I'm not going to pin it down there because we just don't know that much detail. But I will say that, that we have a very young creation. I think science also bears that out. About 4,400 years ago, we had a worldwide flood that covered 20 cubits above the highest mountain. And I also believe that Jesus came 2,000 years ago, died for our sins, so that anyone who believes in him can have eternal life, the free gift of eternal life. And uh, today, we're in the church age and waiting for Christ to come again. So that is the general layout of history. And it's nice that God has given us the history so we know who we are. Every religion tries to answer three basic questions, who we are, where we came from, and what our purpose is here. And I think the Bible does that better than any other religion out there. When, when you start with creation, the, the genealogies are given all the way from Adam and Eve to Jesus. And this is powerful evidence to suggest a young earth. We have in Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 11 Genesis, genealogies that get us from Adam all the way to Abraham. And so in, in Genesis chapter 5, we go basically from Adam to Noah. And not only does it give us the genealogies, it gives us the age at which the parents were when they had their children. And so this, this also indicates that these are consecutive genealogies. There's no separate generations that are in between there. There's a concept called telescoping genealogies, in which we'll discuss later on. This, I'm going to keep this lecture kind of you know, a general overview. But later on, we're going to talk about that in um, Ancient Man, in Dinosaur's Lecture. From the flood to Abraham, it was given in Genesis chapter 11. And here again, we not only have the father-son relationship, but we also have the ages that they were when their sons were born. And here we have, uh, in Exodus 1241, we have 430 years from when uh, Jacob entered Egypt and uh, when they finally left when Moses did all those miracles, and they, or God did those miracles for Moses, and they left. And it says in Exodus 12:41, And at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And so we have a record to the very day. You can see sort of the history that's given there in Exodus. And so Genesis and Exodus are amazing historical accounts. If you just read through them, it sounds like literal history. Beyond that, genealogy is repeated in Matthew from Abraham to Jesus. It says in, in Matthew 1.17, basically verses 2 through 16 go through in detail the genealogy, uh, reiterating it from Abraham Jesus. And Matthew 1.17 basically is a summary of this. And it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and for the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So I take that literally. <laughs> I think to, to do anything else is to undermine the word of God. And I don't want to do that. But not only that, but these gene genealogies are repeated in the first chapter of Chronicles. Luke goes through the ent entire genealogies again. So they're repeated over and over and over again. So I think they're very, very important. And uh, I think part of the reason that's important is to define that Jesus satisfies all of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Um, you've got, he's got to be the, the son of David. He was promised that he would come through the line of Abraham from the tribe of Judah. And if you, if you don't trace it back, how do, you, how do we actually know that Jesus satisfies all the criteria that, that prophecy says he has to satisfy in the Old Testament? It's, a, it's also a powerful testimony that Jesus is the Messiah. So, so I think the genealogies are very important. They're repeated over and over again. And like I said, you've got to throw, if you're going to throw out the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 11 is not historical, then you've also got to throw out First Chronicles. And I, I don't think most people are willing to do that. But also the, the Messianic prophecies go all the way back to Adam and Eve. The seed of woman will crush the head of the serpent. So it's, it's, it, it goes all the way back. And I, just, I love that God has given us a history so that we know who we are and we know where we came from. We're his creation. So... And then we're living the church age right now. So, anyway. More specifically, in these presentation series as a whole, we want you to understand that, that a literal genesis is defendable. It's defendable scientifically, textually, historically, and archaeologically. Uh, Ken Ham had a great quote here. We were talking to him. He said, it's not a blind faith. We have a defendable faith. And that's absolutely true. 
there's a lot of scientists out there. A lot of people think that you, know, you can either believe in science or you can believe in the Bible. This isn't the case. They, they go hand in hand. You can believe in both. And there's a lot of scientists who also believe in a literal history of the Bible and uh, uphold and stand on the Word of God. And here's one of them. His name's Dr. Sarfati. He's from Australia. And uh, he's, he's, a very, he's actually from Jewish heritage, and he speaks Hebrew. And he has written quite a bit of material for the creation science movement and uh, done a lot of work. And uh, there's a whole list of people that prescribe to a literal six-day creation, a young earth, and believe, that, believe um, in a literal history of the Bible. A lot of people. And uh, here's Dr. Sarfati. I think he probably has a photographic memory because he's, pe- he's playing blindfolded 12 people at chess. He's the national chess champion of Australia. And uh, he not only remembers his own moves, he remembers their moves as well. So I don't know how he does that, but it's pretty amazing. But we're just glad he's on our side. <laughs> so, um, but there, there's a book written in six days where they charted 50 of the testimonies of scientists. And they, they show that you can be a scientist and you can believe in a young earth. In this seminar, I want you to understand that there are two worldviews. It's man's truth versus the Bible, not science versus the Bible. Okay? It's the concept that man decides his own truth versus God decides truth. Okay? A lot of people try to portray it as, well, it's science versus the Bible. and that, That's just not so. <clears throat> the next thing that I want you to understand is the evolution of evolution and its impact on history. It is dangerous, I believe. And uh, I usually go into a lot more detail, but um, because we don't have quite as much time doing this in eight parts, I didn't go into to as much as I did. And then the next lecture, we're going to go. I'm going to go through progressive creation, theistic evolution, uh, framework hypothesis, and gap theory. And some of the, and I'm going to get into a lot of detail and go through those and why basically I don't believe that those best fit the textual evidence. But that's going to be next lecture. So this is the general warning we give everyone. This is, these are highly controversial things. I understand that. It's likely that everyone's toes may be stepped on, but I think it's worth discussing these things. At least once. I make, recommend steel-toed shoes or willingness to move your feet to get in line with God's word. Why is creation science important? There, I typically get two responses. And one response, people are all excited about it. They love the material, they want to talk about it, and then the other response is complete apathy. They say, why does this really matter? Does it really matter whether you believe in millions of years? Does it really matter whether you believe in a young earth? What's the big deal? And, uh, and that's a good question, and I'm going to try to help address that today. I, I think it is important, and I think to, that when you really start studying, when you really look into it, it undermines the word of God not to believe in the history that the Bible writes down. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you a reason for the hope that is in, within you, but do so in meekness and in fear. The word answer there, the Greek word is apologia. It means a ready defense. And that's what we are supposed to give to people that ask us a reason for the hope. And a lot of people have a lot of other, other issues before they, you can ever preach the gospel to them and have them accept it. They have a lot of boulders that are in the field that have to be thrown out before you can plant a seed and have something grow. And I think that's one of the things that creation science does is it throws out those boulders out of the field. Uh, I had a good friend. I was about six months into the, to the presentation series, and um, I had a good friend I was studying Greek with. And uh, he told me, basically he was of the side that, that didn't think it was important. And he told me I was wasting my time. And he said, you know, this, you know, you should spend your time studying scripture, memorizing scripture, and doing those types of things, because you'll get a lot farther along. And I thought, well, you know, this guy's, I know he's a godly man, I know, you know, he works hard. And so I started praying about that. And about three days after, I had a plumbing leak in my front yard. And my plumber came out, and he's about my age, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to find out if he's a Christian. And so... I asked him, I said, you know, are, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? And he said, he said, well, you know, I used to go to church, but I decided that that, uh, that, that just wasn't for me. And, I, and I, so I pushed him a little bit further. I said, well, if you don't mind if I ask, why did you decide not to stop going? And he said, he said well, he said, well, there, there was a, I, I was looking at the world. I was looking at all the bad things that happened in the world, death and suffering and all the pain that's in the world. And I just can't believe that loving God would be uh, in charge of it, or would even exist and allow this kind of word, world to exist. And then, the ver- and that's actually pretty common. There's been dozens of books written by theologians addressing that topic, and I think creation science has a very c- 
coherent answer that gets you part of a lot, gets you a lot of the mileage to get you a lot of the way there to answering that question. But then the very next thing out of his mouth was carbon-14 dating. And, <laughs> and I was astounded. This isn't a Harvard professor. This is my plumber that's coming out to fix my plumbing thing. And I'm holding a flashlight. It's late at night and helping him dig in the mud. And uh, he's talking to me about carbon-14 dating. And that sort of confirmed my mind. After, just after three days of having a friend tell me that this was a waste of time, that sort of confirmed in, in my mind the importance of this material and that it is important for people to know and it is important for for people to be taught this stuff. So it's my Plumber John story. But anyway. uh, <clears throat> I just read an article this week, and I, so I added the slide. The New Atheism, the Church of the Non-Believer, was an article written in uh, that magazine Wired. I'd never seen the magazine before. The subtitle under the, the title was A Band of Intellectual Brothers, Dawkins, Dennett, and Harris, is mounting a crusade against the belief in God. Are they winning converts or merely preaching to the choir? That's a scary thought. Here's an excerpt from the article. We are called on, we lack agnostics. And it's interesting in this article, they are upset at agnostics and people who don't believe in Jesus for not sharing their faith, <laughs> for not trying to win converts. And I can understand why you wouldn't. It's not a very good message telling someone, I don't know why we're here, and if you have a few minutes, I can explain to you how you can't know why you're here either. <laughs> but... Um, but here's basically the excerpt I took. We, we are called upon, we lax agnostics, we non-committal non-believers, we vague deists who would be embarrassed to defend antique absurdities like the virgin birth. We are called out, we fence-sitters, and told to help ex- exercise this debilitating curse, the curse of faith. Every day, people's faith is being attacked. If you just watch Discovery Channel or read the news or watch the nightly news, we find things that should be seen as contrary to our faith. And they are an attack on our faith. And I think in order to be a stable Christian, not turned to and fro by every whim of idle doctrine, we need to know these things so that we can stand firm, so that nothing can move us, and uh, so that we can grow in Christ. So I, I think that these things are very, very important. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God. He's for teaching, rebuking, training, correcting, and righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so I believe this also includes the first few chapters in Genesis. It's interesting because Satan doesn't need to attack Christ himself to undermine the word of God in people's minds. He can attack the first few chapters in Genesis and people can say, oh, the Bible's antiquated, so why should I believe any of the rest of it? I think a significant number of people have done that. Uh, But basically there's two worldviews. There's one worldview that says, amazing, a big bang made this world from nothing. Zero nada. And uh, that is the humanist worldview. And it, it basically says that man is God and answers to no one. And they relish in that for some reason. <laughs> I find it comforting the fact that there is a God. Uh, this, is, this is Jeremy Rifkin from a book called Algeny. We no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. Do they obey the law, I wonder? It is our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible for nothing outside ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I wonder where he got that from. (laughs) Sounds like he's read the Bible. This is basically their worldview. And it's interesting now that they understand what evolution means. They understand what the Big Bang means. They were theories that were specifically created for the purpose of dismissing God from the equation. Uh, The second worldview is incredible design. There must be a designer. And uh, it's a creationist worldview. And it says, God is God and judges men. So it's appointed once for man to die and after that to face judgment. Next we're going to talk about biases. Everyone has a bias. And it's important to mention that. And biases are sort of our starting point for how we look at the world. Um, And sometimes it's called faith, axiom, or presuppositions. But I'm going to call it a bias. It's basically a principle accepted as true without proof. God versus materialism. Okay? The question is, which bias best conforms to reality and makes logical sense of the evidence? And why do we need a bias? What's the, what's the purpose for a bias? Does it play any role at all? Do we need one? 
I think we do. And um, the reason we do, this is an example here, that circle represents all knowledge in the universe. Okay? Everything that you need to know about everything that's in the universe, that's all knowledge. Okay? This dot here represents the amount of knowledge that I know in the universe. Okay? That's actually not drawn to scale. It would, you wouldn't be able to see it if it was drawn to scale because I know so little about the universe. And so in order for you to look at the world, because we don't know everything, you have to have some starting point. You have to have some way of interpreting the evidence. And this is, this is the bias. If you knew everything, you wouldn't need a bias, right? You know everything. <laughs> you'd, you'd look at a rock on the ground, and you'd know the exact history of that rock. you know whether it was igneous rock, which comes from lava flows or sedimentary rock. you know everything about it. But we don't. We have to make assumptions. We have to make presuppositions about that. So uh, it's interesting, though. A, a lot of atheists and, and non-believers claim that they're unbiased. They're just looking at the evidence, seeing where it takes them. Here, this is the uh, homepage of the U.S. Geological Survey. And it says, as an unbiased, multidisciplinary science organization. Do you believe that? I don't. Translation, we know it all. We, we know everything in that orange circle. We know it all because we don't have bias. We, we don't need to interpret anything with our bias. Uh, Dr. Sylvester, a geologist, said this. And the fact that he's a biologist makes this especially funny. He says, if you don't have... I'm sorry, a geologist makes this funny. If you don't have a bias, you are a rock. This is Rich, the guy I usually do the presentation series with, standing beside him. And uh, he said, he's, he's from Romania, and he said, we were kind of like the paparazzi a couple of years ago. They had a creation science, a uh, big creation science seminar where they had all these guys come from all over Europe and Australia and all over the place. And uh, basically, we were like the paparazzi going around, getting pictures with them all, getting them signing our books. And so anyway, it was kind of funny. But, uh, but he was a really great guy, and he got saved later on in life. And uh, he started out as an, uh, as an atheist, and he ended up converting over to a young earth creationist. And his story is pretty interesting. But we all have a bias. We use our biases to look at the evidence. And, uh, and then we, we take the evidence and we use logic, which are rules for correct thinking, and we come up with an explanation for that evidence we see. And when we look at a lot of different evidences, we form sort of a paradigm. And so when, when really you're witnessing to t- someone, you're telling them about Jesus, you're not just trying to win them over on one argument. You need to change their entire way of thinking, their entire paradigm. So to sort of illustrate the, the concept of a paradigm, we've got this glass, and it is half filled with water, or is it half empty? Um, and this is a fact, so it's got water in it halfway. You've basically got two different views. You got It's either half full or it's half empty. Whichever way you view it is kind of your bias. And so if you, if you see an empty glass and you think that it was filled up halfway, you'd say it was half full. If you think that it was full all the way and someone came along and drank it, you'd say it's half empty. And so, so that's kind of like your bias. And you might call that optimism or pessimism, whatever you want to say. Um, but there's two basic ways of looking at the universe. There's, you can either look at it through man's theories, so, or you can look at it through the Bible. And we should use our biblical glasses to look at everything, obviously. Uh, but this doesn't just apply to creation evolution debate. This applies to every aspect of our lives, everything we think about. And so, including the way we drive and our behavior. So, um, it's important to understand that Genesis is foundational to virtually every Christian doctrine. It, ha- it has their roots in Genesis. And have you ever come into a movie halfway and uh, been completely clueless as to what's going on, who the characters are, you know, wh- why so and so is mad at so and so, or what's going on, and you just sort of walk out because you're frustrated because it doesn't make any sense to you? That's kind of the way the Bible is if you take out Genesis. You lose Abraham, you lose a lot of history, and you, don't <clears throat> you basically don't have any context for the rest of the story. So uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is, is very foundational. It's foundational to marriage. Matthew, um, and the verses I, notice the verses I quote here are in other passages other than Genesis. I could have quoted Genesis, but Genesis is, one, is arguably one of the most quoted books in the entire Bible which shows uh, how important it is. So, uh, leave father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, death and sin. This is, I can't stress this enough, and I'm going to talk about it more in the next presentation. 
But uh, basically, Romans 5.12 says, Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. The relationship between sin and death is very well established as a doctrine, and, and that's a very, very important concept. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, The first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. If Adam's mythology, does that, what does that mean about Christ, who's the last Adam? And why would uh, Paul be comparing Christ to the first Adam if he's a mythological creature? Uh, the gospel also, for as an Adam all dies, so in Christ all will be made alive. And uh, the Trinity, let us make man in our own image. So there's, there's all kinds of doctrines that find their root in Genesis, and it's extremely important. People see quotes like this, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and they don't see this as an affront to their faith as an attack on their faith, and I, I believe that they should. And it, partly because it's calling Jesus a liar. Jesus says in Matthew 19.4, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read? He created them from the beginning, made them male and female. He's saying he made Adam and Eve from the beginning. If Jesus took Genesis literally, maybe we should too. And not only that, Paul took Genesis literally, Peter took Genesis literally. Apparently everyone took Genesis literally. It's just been in the past 150 years that people haven't. But this is what's going on today. Um, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews' stumbling block. Jews have context for the gospel. They know that the Messiah is coming. They know the prophecies in the Old Testament. And so they stumble over the gospel. They understand the gospel. They just don't believe it, so they stumble over it. Uh, unto the Greeks' foolishness. And, and the Greeks, they don't have any context for the gospel. A Greek might say, well, I don't believe in God, if you try to tell them the gospel. And how are you going to tell someone they need Jesus if they don't even believe in God? very curious how someone can do that. I don't think you can. And the question I would pose is, do you think that American culture today is more like the Jewish culture or the Greek culture? I think the answer is, yeah, emphatically Greek culture. You talk to almost anyone in this information age where we have free information, you just go on to Wikipedia. It's the tome of all knowledge. And you can, you can get any, any information you want to know. And basically, people, you talk to people nowadays, and everyone has their own ideas, and, and if, we're not found, if we're not sure and firm on what, what we believe and know why we believe what we believe, we're not going to convince people except Christ. So, so sort of, the, I, th- I see the purpose of creation science is to bring people back to Genesis so that they have sort of a context for the gospel, so that they, they do know that the Bible is not antiquated. I, a, a friend of mine just two weeks ago was talking to me and he said, Ray, isn't the Bible antiquated? It's exactly what he said. And so I started to talk to him. I said, no, I don't think it is. And you should be able to sort of defend your faith. Remember, Paul went in Acts, went to the synagogue day after day and reasoned with the people. He wasn't just sort of scattering seed everywhere and, and just hoping that some of it sinks in. He was going there to convince people day after day and to reason with them. And I, I think he set a good example doing that. That sort of goes back to the parable of the sower. I believe that the ground in America has become thorny and rocky because of evolutionary indoctrination. 200 years ago or 150 years ago in America, most people believed in the Bible, believed that it was absolutely true. And I think most people today in America do not. They think that the Bible has errors in it. The gospel needs prepared ground. Creation science prepares the ground so that seed can be scattered and a good harvest reached. Here's what typically happens, though, to a lot of Christian families. Their, their kids start out on the right track. The parents teach them the right thing. And uh, they start going to schools, both secular and private. And by the time they get through high school and college, their faith has been challenged so much that they, and, and they've never been given the other side, because you're certainly not going to get the other side from Discovery Channel, that they don't have a leg to stand on and they end up giving up their faith. And uh, this is called brainwashing. Here's an example of that. E.O. Wilson, who's now a humanist, said this. As a many person from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Seven Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolutionary theory. I wonder how many people have left the faith because of ideas that are contrary to Scripture. I think a lot of people. It's interesting that, that the indoctrination starts very young. You know, just, just look at this. It says, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of years. Again, so you ask any five-year-old, they'll usually, and you ask them when the dinosaurs lived, they usually tell you millions of years ago. And their eyes will glaze over. I don't know what that means, but it's a long time ago. 
uh, Ken Ham, the president of Answers in Genesis, which is a great organization. Their website's answersingenesis.org. And I would encourage anyone who has questions, science-related questions, to go there. And they've got a great search engine, and they've got thousands of articles out there. And uh, maybe not thousands, but certainly hundreds, and on virtually every topic. And um, it's just a really good organization for providing people with information. They disseminate, disseminate a lot of information from Institute for Creation Research and a lot of the other people that have done good research. And Ken Ham says this, We have many letters from people indicating that they would not listen to the claims of Christianity because they thought evolution had proved it wrong. I believe that's absolutely true. This is what's been happening for a long time. And this was actually written in Ken Ham's book, The Lie Evolution, that was published 20 years ago. And basically we have the evolutionists on one side, and we have the creationists on the other side. We have evolution shooting at our foundation. Basically they're just tearing away at our foundation. And we have all kinds of different Christians up here doing different things. Some people are sleeping at the helm. Some people are uh, shooting off the wrong direction. Some people are are getting mad at each other and aiming it at at other Christians. And uh, some people are addressing all these uh, woes that, that are represented by the balloons up top, homosexuality and a lot of the other things that the Bible says are wrong. And we sort of have humanism sort of just been taking shots at us over and over again. It's interesting that that evolutionists understand that there's a war going on, there's a battle going on, that they want us to leave our faith. And this is what Sir Arthur Keith says, The law of Christ is incompatible with the law of evolution. Nay, the two laws are at war with each other. He gets it. He understands that they're like oil and water. They don't mix. Evolution doesn't mix with with the Bible. Um, Richard Bozerth says this in The Meaning of Evolution from the American Atheist. Christ has fought and still fights and will continue to fight science to the desperate end over evolution. I don't think Christianity. I I don't think Christianity fights that. I think it's really fighting humanism. Um, because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life, life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the, and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for your sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. I think he's right. I think if evolution is true, and then that proves that the Bible is not true, and there's no reason to accept any of it. So, uh, but it's interesting that they understand the wars going on because a lot of Christians are denying that there's any conflict going on at all. They say, no, we're, we, we can all get along. We can all be happy together. And it's like, well, when challenges are made against God's word, we can't just sit, sit back and just sort of twiddle our thumbs, right? Okay. Uh, so this is what we need to be doing. We need to be aiming at their foundations. And foundations is evolution and the other theories that they have put forth for the specific purpose of eliminating God from the picture. And we need, if we take aim at those, then uh, we'll do much better in destroying the castle because once the foundation is destroyed, the building falls down. It's important to understand, I'm going to give a little bit of history now, sort of how we got to where we are. Uh, evolution is a new belief within Christian circles. For nearly 2,000 years, all Christians believed and taught that the earth was young as revealed by God's word. We were pretty much unified on that. <clears throat> In the early 1800s, some unbelievers began to teach that the earth was millions of years old. Uh, There's a great book, Annals of the World, written by Usher. And it was actually translated in Latin. It's about that thick. And it's kind of nice to sort of read through it because he he actually takes the Bible as his framework and works all the way from Adam to the present. And he wrote it in the 1500s or so. Uh, They sell it on Answers in Genesis. But uh, he starts with the Bible as his framework. And... He basically came to the conclusion that it's, that it's a young earth. The genealogies are clear about that. Um, this is an interesting quote. Originally, humans were born from animals of a different kind. Who thinks that this quote was said yesterday, a year ago, ten years ago, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago? It was quoted by Plutarch as Anaximander saying it in 610 to 540 B.C. Thank you. The idea of evolution is extremely old, and the same hollow and deceptive philosophies to convince people that God isn't real for a long, long time. That's what this shows me. But basically, sort of the history of where we got where we are, uniformitarianism was the general concept recently was put forth by James Hutton. And uh, he was actually a medical doctor. He wasn't a geologist at all, but he liked kind of digging in the dirt. And he actually never worked as a medical doctor. He went and 
farmed on a 100-acre plot of land. So he was kind of an eccentric guy. And uh, he was such a horrible writer that no one actually read his book, not very many people. And so it really wasn't popularized as much as it could have been. And a Lyle came, Charles Lyle, the third one on the list there, came by a little bit later and basically redid some of his work and modified it. And he was a much, much better writer. And he basically popularized the idea of uniformitarianism. What uniformitarianism is, I guess I should explain that. It, it's the idea that, the, that wind and erosion and the current processes that are geologic processes that, that are occurring right now have been occurring for millions of years to produce the strata. And this is opposed to what we believe as Christians, which is that the, the flood had a tremendous impact on geology, and wind and erosion has only been occurring for the past few thousand years. But, uh, and, and then, a little bit later, after uh, Lyle, you have Darwin, who uh, published Origin of the Species. And so those four are the three kind of main... There's a lot more figures in this that, that play in, but these are sort of the main guys who sort of established the atheistic uh, basis, the, the scientific atheistic foundation for their views. And then you have, um, basically, Thomas Chalmers and C.I. Schofield, who took those ideas and incorporated them into scripture. And uh, they're, they're theologians. I'm, they had a lot right. Okay? I'm not against everything they preached. You, you chew the meat and you spit out the bones. It's, you know, we, everything I, what I say is not God's word. You know, God's word is, is absolutely true, but not everything I say may be absolutely true. But these guys, basically C.I. Schofield, he had a lot of his theology right, but he basically incorporated sort of a gap theory and day age theory into his Bible commentary, and it was an incredibly popular Bible commentary. Uh, it was the first in commentary of the entire Bible ever written. And so, uh, but, but I think he made a mistake when he uh, incorporated the outside ideas into Scripture instead of deriving uh, an interpretation from Scripture which is what we should do. James Hutton says this, and this sort of defines uniformitarianism. It says, In the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. That's his assumption, his bias. He's assuming there is no God. Read that very carefully. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be omitted except those which we know the principle. That is an atheistic bias. And when we read that, we need to understand that. Second Peter 3, 3-6, through 6, this, and this is a, an astounding passage, and it took me months to realize the importance of it. This is basically, I believe, a prophecy about today, the day that we live in today. And he says, first, beware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff. Are we living in the last days? Yes, we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years, and for 2,000 years, people have been scoffed at, and worse following after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of your coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they have been since the beginning of creation. All things continuing as they have been. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like uniformitarianism. They willfully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth existed out of water and through water by the word of God. So they're willfully ignorant of what? That God spoke the world into existence by his word. What are people ignorant of today? that God spoke the world into existence through water by his word. And then it says, Through these the world of that time perished when it was flooded by water. And that's another thing that people are also ignorant of, that the world, there was a worldwide flood. That's something that even in most Christian circles is disregarded. Uh, they don't believe it. And I'm going to go over that in the third lecture. And it's astounding, the textual evidence for the flood. And this is catastrophism, what we what Christians call catastrophism, that the, a catastrophe of biblical proportions basically determine a lot of the geologic evidences that we see today. And a lot of the limestone you see today, just where we live, probably that your house is built on, was laid down during the flood. So, uh, Colossians 2 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to tradition of men, according to the rudimentary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And so Paul tells us, not to be taken captive. And there are ho a lot of hollow and deceptive philosophies out there. And we need, we need to stand firm on God's word and we need to study it and uh, continue to, to be conforming our mind in that way by studying God's word and by knowing what it means so that we, we're not susceptible to be taken captive by 
um, by hollow deceptive philosophies. And also the elementary principles of the world, that's kind of like evolution, isn't it? Kind of sort of smacks of those kind of philosophies. Lyle said this, and this sort of speaks as to Lyle's bias, his presuppositions. It says, Lyle said, Lyle said his goal was to free the sciences from Moses. What do you suppose that means? <laughs> He's certainly not starting with scripture, is he? Okay, uh, so the theory, the theory of the Earth by James Hutton made people doubt that the Earth was 6,000 years old. Principles of Geology by Lyle made people doubt there was a flood and the origin of the species made people doubt there was a creator. And so Charles Darwin, for age 22, fresh out of school to be a preacher, of all things, set sail to HMS Beagle in 1831. Darwin brought his Bible and Charles Lyle's book with him on his five-year voyage. Charles Lyle's books changed his life forever. I wish I could say it was the other way around. I wish I could say God's word changed his life forever. But it looked like he, uh, he, he preferred the, philosophy, the hollow and deceptive philosophy put forth in Lyle's book of trying to free the sciences from Moses, as if Moses wasn't historic. <laughs> so uh, it, this is Charles Darwin himself who wrote this. Disbelief in the Bible crept over me at a very slow rate. But at last complete, the rate was so slow that I felt no distress. So that's also kind of his bias as well. He, he doesn't believe the Bible. Why, why should he use that as a framework? Darwin's book is incredibly boring. If you're having sleeping problems, put it by your bed. Start reading a little bit of it. sure to put you to sleep. It's very, very boring. But this is, I think this is from uh, the second to last uh, paragraph in his book. It's from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals directly follows. Who's the hero of the plot here? Famine and death? <laughs> it doesn't sound like a very good picture of the world to me, but, but it's interesting. Does anyone know the title of The Origin of the Species? The full title? It's The Origin of the Species or the Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. It was blatantly racist. They don't teach that in biology class because it was a blatantly racist title. I think you should teach kids history, warts and all. Some people think it looks good on paper, so they put it on their 10-pound notes. I don't. I think it's dangerous. It's poisonous. It's not something you should teach your kids. And uh, we're going we're gonna to go into, in biology, we're going to go into a lot of like DNA and a lot of things that talk against evolution. The effect of evolution in history has been for the negative. We, we have evolutionists like Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot who killed significant portions of their people. Stalin was exporting grain uh, to fund, to buy steel to fund industrialization. And uh, he knew that a lot of people would die. And he basically starved about six or seven million Ukrainians. And I believe that he knew that would happen. And he knew that a significant number of people would die. But what does it matter, though? If you're, if you're descended from an earthworm, you're really not worth anything more than an earthworm. And so what's the big deal with people dying? In the same way with Hitler. He was blatantly racist, and I think his evolutionary and atheistic philosophies played into that. Same way with Pol Pot. Pol Pot killed uh, one-third to half a million people, which is, uh, it doesn't sound like as many as these other guys, but that was half the entire population in Cambodia during the Cambodian Khmer Rouge in the 70s. It was during my lifetime. Um, there's, a, there's a great book written by Henry Morris, uh, The Long War Against God, and uh, he, he covers a lot of history and a lot of the influences of evolution. He's got a lot of quotes in here, like 500 quotes in here. It's a really great book. Darwin says this uh, in The Descent of Man. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost ex certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Blatantly racist. Theodore Roosevelt believed they were inferior races like the Indians. Gives new meaning to the Rough Riders. He was also an evolutionist. Went out and killed the Indians. It astounds me that every group of people thinks that their particular race is superior to all the other races. And so here we have Japanese. Uh, the Japanese were taught that they had evolved farther and were therefore superior to all other races. Japanese scientists produced studies decrying the apish physical features of other races, hairiness, long arms, and noted highly evolved characteristics of, other, of the Japanese, which included milder body odor. Hmm. I guess I'm not very highly evolved. 
Uh, Stephen Jay Gould says this, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Before evolution, there were, probably, there were racists around, but they didn't really have any justification for it. The Bible certainly isn't any justification for racism. And, uh, and so they find, found it very hard to justify. Well, evolution comes along, and all of a sudden it says, hey, we're descended from the apes, and therefore they say that certain people were less evolved. So it, this is Stephen Jay Gould. He's one of the largest proponents of evolution. So it means a lot coming from him. He's not a Christian by any means. The Bible says in Acts 17, 35, And he hath made of one blood all nations for to dwell on the earth, hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. We are all from one blood. We're all from Adam and Eve. This also seems to indicate that Genesis should be taken literally, huh? It's interesting, though, the races. We are of the human race, aren't we? We're human race. So if we, when you drive by certain different kinds of colors of cows, a white cow, a brown cow, a black cow, you don't look at them and say, look at all the different races of cows. I think race is misused word. I think we're all of the same race, the human race. And uh, we, we're all of, of one blood from Adam and Eve, and we're all loved by God. So and I, the Bible close, shows that very clearly. But that's not the picture you would get from evolution, is it? 